this chapter, we're going to be covering chemical bonding and more specifically how to interpret our Lewis structures. So, in chapter 10, we covered how to design our Lewis structures to minimize the formal charge around all the atoms and to satisfy the octet rule. But in chapter 11, we're looking at what is the molecular geometry, electron geometry, and how this affects polarity and the molecular bonding. So, we can first understand the Vesper theory. So that is the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. It sounds complicated, but if you think about it, electron pair repulsion is the key part. And this happens in the valence shell. So it makes perfect sense. What we have is in molecules such as water, where we have a lone pair of electrons and we have two bonds. The lone pair of electrons has a effect on the bonds. For example, it will repel the bonds, right? Electron pair repulsion theory. So that is why water takes a bent shape. It's not going to be linear. It's going to be bent. The, there's going to be an angle at which the OH bonds are bent because of the repulsion from the electron pairs. So basically, the electron pairs repel bonds. And this is a key concept of this chapter. There are two types of geometries. One is the electron geometry, and the second is the molecular geometry. The electron geometry takes into account the number of electron containing groups. We will define this in a minute. The molecular geometry takes into account the effect of those lone pairs, meaning the repulsion effect, on the shape of the molecule. So molecular geometry is more of the three-dimensional arrangement of the molecule itself, right? And it's not really factoring in the positions of the electrons, but it's taking into effect into account what they do, which is repel the bonds. So what is an electron group? we can represent the electron groups by the steric number. And it's just a number, one through six, that it represents the number of, I call it limbs, right? Number of limbs. That means the there could be four types of limbs, a lone pair, a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, that's it. So if you have a lone pair, it's one limb. Two lone pairs, two limbs. Single bond, another limb. Double bond, another limb. Triple bond, another limb, right? These are limbs that come off of the central atom. The steric number, which is how many of those occur. So for this molecule on nitrogen, we have a limb as the lone pair, a single bond and a double bond, that's three, right? So the steric number is three. So based on the steric number, we can determine the electron and the molecular geometries. So this chart represents the molecular geometries for several types of molecules. We can go through the steric number, meaning the number of electron groups, and we can make the differentiation based on how many of these electron groups are bonds and how many of these electron groups are lone pairs. For example, the most simple one, which is steric number two, meaning you have one bond and another bond. It's a linear arrangement. You have no electron pairs that are repelling the bonds. So it's linear and the degrees are 180. Steric number three, we have two possible choices. One, where we have three bonds. In this case, it is a trigonal planar, so they're equally distributed throughout, let's say, a circle, which is 360 degrees. You have 120 each for each angle. Then we have two bonds and one lone pair. So we get rid of one of the bonds, put a lone pair, and that lone pair will act to bend the structure, right? These bonds will be repelled by the lone pair. So that means the angle is going to be less than 120. Then steric number four, we have three possible arrangements. Four bonds, three bonds and one lone pair, two bonds and two lone pairs. So you can kind of see the pattern of what we're getting at. And for the molecular geometry, if we just have four bonds, it's called tetrahedral. For three bonds and one lone pair, like a, a, a ammonia, trigonal pyramidal. For something like water, it's gonna be bent because we have two lone pairs that push down on the bonds, right? And the more lone pairs you have pushing down, the tighter the angle is going to be. You see that this is a lot less than 109, should be closer to 100. Meanwhile, for a trigonal pyramidal, this angle will be probably a little bit less than 109. For steric number five, we have several arrangements as well. You can read these. Several, steric number six, same thing, but uh, we call it octahedral, right? It's a key thing because if we have um, six bonded groups, so six bonds on a central atom, we call it an octahedral arrangement. Octa usually means eight, but in this case, it means six. So we call it octahedral. And then as we increase the number of electron groups, we have a variety of different molecular geometries. So that's the molecular geometry. It depends on the bonded groups, what atoms are bound to the central atom. Now, the electron geometry, which is more simple, represents just the steric number. So it does not differentiate between electron groups and bonds. So, for example, for steric number three, they are all trigonal planar. 
as the electron geometry. For steric number four, they're all tetrahedral as the electron geometry. For five, trigonal bipyramidal, and for six, octahedral. This is their electron geometries for all of them. That's because we do not differentiate between the groups being lone pair electrons and being bonds. So that's the difference between molecular and electron geometry. All right, so the rest of these slides are just covering that. And then we can take it a step further and we can say based on these shapes, we can determine the polarity of these molecules, right? Based on the symmetry, once we know the shape, we can then determine if it's symmetrical or not, and we could assess the bonds and if they are electronegative or if there's electronegativity difference or not. But also, if we have a molecule that has multiple central atoms, we can say that, for example, around this carbon, the molecule is tetrahedral. Around the oxygen, because there's two lone pairs, the molecule will be bent. So we can say that there are two electron and molecular geometries, one for, and for each atom. So there's four possible questions you could ask there. I could ask, what is the molecular and electron geometries for carbon? Same thing for oxygen. So the polarity, we understand that polarity is a difference in electronegativity, but if the molecule is symmetrical, you have a net zero dipole, meaning there's no difference in electronegativity. So this can be used after we know our molecular geometry, not our electron geometry. Once we know the molecular geometry, we can then figure out, is the molecule symmetrical? In water's case, it's not symmetrical because you have a bent structure, you have a net dipole. Same thing for uh, the ammonia. And here are some other molecules where we can figure it out for ourselves. The next thing we can talk about is hybridization. And for a TLDR on hybridization, the number of electron groups, remember those are the, the lone pair electrons and the bonds, we can figure out the hybridization, meaning which orbitals are kind of in an intermediate energy level that creates this bonding. So it's really easy. Two electron groups attached, SP hybridized. That means you have one S and one P hybridized, right? So that's two letters, two electron groups, two letters, three electron groups, SP2, three letters, right? SP and P. So think about it, think about it as SP squared. So that's SPP, three letters, three electron groups, four electron groups, four letters, SP3, something like methane, five electron groups, D SP3, it's five letters, six electron groups, six letters, D2 SP3. That's it. If you memorize that, you're good. You can figure out the hybridization of any atom based on the number of electron groups that comes out of it. So for example, here's methane. We have, this is, we know it's tetrahedral. We know that there's four bonds coming out of it. Doesn't matter if they're bonds or not. We know that there are four groups coming out. It's tetrahedral, that's it. And it's an sp3. For example, uh, the ammonia is also sp3 hybridized because you have three bonds, and we have one lone pair that's not shown here. So the hybridization is pretty easy. The concept behind it, though, is a little bit difficult because we need to understand that you have two orbitals, S and a P orbital, that are hybridizing, and they're, in, they're creating intermediate energy levels. Now, this is where the bonding occurs. So with this idea of hybridization, we can also understand the sigma and the pi bond. Now, sigma bond is just a single bond. The pi bond is any additional bond to the single bond. What that means is if you have a double bond, there is one sigma and one pi. A triple bond, one sigma and two pi's. And the sigma bonds are stronger because they occur along the axis of the nuclei. Bonds can rotate, single bonds can rotate, double and triple have a really tough difficulty of rotating. And the last concept of this chapter is understanding the molecular orbital diagram. So we can, when we determine the hybridization of molecular orbitals when they create bonding. So right now, all we did with orbitals up until this point is single atoms. We wrote the atomic orbital diagram. Now we can talk about the molecular orbital diagram. There are two possibilities in this case. We can have bonding electrons in bonding orbitals, and we can have anti-bonding orbitals, which basically make the molecule less stable because they are at higher energy. So we can have sigma and pi, which is the bonding. Then we can have sigma star and pi star, which are the anti-bonding, otherwise known as the excited state. So 
in essence, what we can do. And from this, so why are we doing this? And what is it? We can figure out the bond order, which is the bonded electrons minus the antibonding electrons divided by two. If this bond order is positive, we can then figure out if the bond order is positive, the molecule will occur and it's stable. If the bond order is negative or zero, well, it would never be negative. If the bond order is zero, then the molecule is not stable. So we can see we can see that. Also, we can see if the molecule is diamagnetic or paramagnetic. Paramagnetic meaning it has unpaired electrons. Diamagnetic means it has all paired electrons. So all you do, very simple, is you take the valence electron shell of each atom. So it's hydrogen two. It, they both occur in the one s. You put your one s down. You put your one s down. You have your sigma. Then you have your sigma star, and you fill them up from bottom to top, low energy to high. So one electron from the valence of the hydrogen comes to the middle, to the middle bottom to sigma. The other one comes to the same sigma. The bond order would therefore be bonding minus non-bonding, or bond, bonding minus anti-bonding. Two minus zero divided by two is one. The bond order is one. It's stable, and there can only be one bond. For helium, on the other hand, we have a filled 1s shell, right? So this means that if we fill this up, fill up the middle sigma and sigma star, you get anti-bonding and bonding. 2 minus 2 is 0, divided by 2 is 0, and this is a bond order of 0, meaning it does not occur. So there is no, and that makes sense because we know helium is in noble gas. So we can do this for more complicated molecules like O2, and there are different molecular orbitals. And this is based on experimentation, so don't really worry about this, but the way to fill them out is you, and you have to worry about how to fill them out, is you put the valence electrons in with the arrows on, for oxygen, let's say you're two, we have an example for oxygen here, we have, it is 2P4. So we put down our four electrons, and then we have our four electrons for the other oxygen. What happens is these electrons, you have a total of eight electrons. You fill up the molecular orbitals going from bottom to top. That's it. So you do, and using off balance principles, you go one, two, and sigma, one in one of the pies, one in the other pi, then you go back to the other first pi, and then second pi. Then you have one in each of the pi stars. Once you do the bond order, you can say that there are eight bonding electrons. There are, in, in total, counting the s orbital as well, and there are four anti-bonding electrons. There's two on the s orbitals and two on the p orbitals. And then you have eight minus four is four divided by two is two bond order is two oxygen likes to have two bonds. So that's really it. There could be nitrogen. We can do the same thing and we can figure out that nitrogen is diamagnetic because there are no lone pair electrons. There are no lone electrons that are not paired oxygen on the other hand has two electrons that are not paired. Therefore it's power magnetic. So we can do this for. Any type of molecule, really, um, any type of simple molecule, even with even with uh, molecules that don't have two of the same elements, such as carbon monoxide, we can do the same thing. We fill it up just from bottom to top, and we can determine the bond order and if it's diamagnetic and if the molecule is stable based on the bond order. So that's basically it. If you have any questions, please leave a comment and subscribe and please like the video. Thank you.